Hi, and welcome to another episode of This Week in Triathlon. My name is Andres, and I am coming to you live from California. Today is August 8th. Can't believe we're already in August. This year has gone by super quickly, and I'm joined today by a resident pro triathlete, co-host, and co-creator of this wonderful show, Kevin Tedonio. Kevin, how are you doing today? Uh, it looks like Kevin muted his microphone again. He's he's trying to test me uh, to see if I can read lips, but uh, I, you know I I still have to uh, to practice my my uh, my leap or your lip Tom, reading. Your, your, yeah, your, yeah, exactly. your, your Tom Cruise from Mission Impossible, but uh, I'm doing well. Uh, I, this year has gone by pretty quickly, but this morning was just dragging by. I had a hard workout, and you know it's one of those workouts that just you, know, you dread going in because it's so hard and. Um, you know, it was going by pretty slowly, but doing well, Andres. But, you know, you've got a, a pretty big race coming up uh, in Tahoe, and, uh, I mean, you've got your eyes on, on the prize, and, and without giving too much away, um, this is something that you're preparing for, and, and there, not every training day is going to be fun, but uh, I'm sure you, in the back of your mind, you know that this is going to be for the better. Yeah, I just came back from um, from Boulder 70.3 uh, last Sunday, and, you um, yeah, obviously an altitude race, and uh, I'm I'm going to be talking about some of the race recap there. Looking forward to sharing some of the insight there. But uh, you know, been on the road for a couple weeks, and uh, we got about six weeks till Ironman Tahoe up at uh, over six thousand feet. So I'm looking forward to that race. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, so we'll we'll definitely get into a little bit more about the uh, Boulder 70.3 coming up. But uh, we want to talk a little bit about what we've got coming up today. Uh, we've got somebody from Santini, Steve Medcroft. He is. Uh, for lack of a better description, he is Santini USA. Uh, Santini is, is one of your sponsors. They've been uh, generous this year, and uh, it, <laughs> as you show off your your uh, Santini uh, shirt, I think Steve is is probably wearing the same shirt, so you guys can be uh, twins. Um, but as I was saying, uh, we'll also get into 70.3, the results, and also uh, I think everybody's curious to hear about your take on the race. Uh, a race at altitude, as you mentioned, and who knows, maybe a little preview of, of how challenging Tahoe is going to be. Um, another thing that we want to definitely get into is uh, the news about Marino. He made up his mind. He commented publicly uh, on a number of, of things. Uh, a, the uh, the fact that he's not going to be racing Kona, which is pretty interesting. Um, it, I think it's a good decision. But the other thing is the KPR uh, points classification, which... Jay Pursun wrote an article about, which we'll get into, and uh, we'll also touch base on the KPR classification since we skipped the show last week. Um, aside from that, um, obviously we want to invite everybody to join us on uh, Facebook, facebook.com uh, slash uh, This Week in Triathlon, and you can comment on there. We'll make sure that we get you set up with some free swag. But um, let's see if we can get Steve on here. Uh, let's uh, show that again, Kevin. Yeah, we got, we got all sorts of swag. And to be honest, I, I really want to give away this swag. My, my wife keeps giving me uh, the business about having all this swag in our office. So I got we got some K-Edge uh, chain catchers uh, from our friends up in Boise. We got some uh, Infinite Nutrition, Infinite Mud. This stuff retails for about 35 bucks a bag. I had some this morning on my bike ride. It was great, and especially for when it starts to get a little bit colder and you're kind of sick of drinking sports drinks like you've been drinking all summer. This stuff's kind of like a, it's got flaxseed in it. Uh, it almost, it's almost like granola and coffee in a in a water bottle, if you can believe that. And it actually tastes really good, and has lots of energy. Uh, also got some shirts from Shimano. Yeah, so like you said, lots of stuff, and it looks like um, Steve is uh, has has joined us. And uh, let's uh, let's ask Steve. Um, there he is. Um, hey, bud. Can you hear us, Steve? I can hear I'm just trying to see it myself, so I know what I'm looking at here. Currently in a vehicle. Technology. There we go. I'm here. You're right. I am wearing the same shirt. Hey, all right. Nice. Yeah, so right. you, guys are, you guys are twins uh, today, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> for, um, for everybody who, uh, who obviously Steve is... is uh, you know, he's like we were saying, he's Santini USA. 
Um, but um, thanks for, for joining us, Steve. We're, we're excited to talk a, bit, a little bit about Santini today. Uh, we were saying that you guys have been generous enough to, uh, to work with Kevin this year. And, um, you know, he's, uh, he's definitely been wearing the, uh, the clothing and, and had some awesome feedback. So, um, yeah, he's ma making it look good. I appreciate that. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about the uh, Santini, uh, for those who are not familiar with the company as, as familiar as we are, tell us a little bit about the, the history of the company. Sure. I mean, uh, Santini's been producing clothing for cyclists around the world for about 50 years out of Bergamo, Italy. Um, Pietro Santini, the guy who founded the company, he was uh, sort of an amateur racer. Uh, uh, the story his daughters tell me is that he he was good, but uh, maybe wasn't going to be dest his destiny wasn't uh, the professional ranks. And I guess he broke his leg about 18 years old, right about that age where you have to figure out what you're going to do next with your life, and that took him out of racing. So he convinced his sisters, who owned a little knitwear factory, to let him set up a machine and he started producing jerseys for his racing friends and teams he was connected to. And, and that blossomed and grew, and he took that factory over. And or today, Santini's uh, 120 employees, still based in a factory in Bergamo, Italy, still producing all the clothing uh, right in the same place. We, uh, we do uh, a collection of clothing for shops, but we also do clothing for... Uh, we're the official supplier to the UCI, so every world champion who pulls on a rainbow stripe jersey, it's a Santini jersey. We do uh, all the clothing for the Giro d'Italia, so if, you, if you're if you standing in pink at the end of the day in the Giro d'Italia, that's a Santini jersey. We do clothing for Green Edge, Vacon Soleil, Katusha, and about a thousand clubs and teams around the world as well. That's Santini. That's uh, that's really cool, and uh, obviously you're, uh, you're getting into triathlon. Um, as well, you've got a couple of pieces next to you. Um, so, tell us a little bit about what Santini is, is doing with uh, with on the triathlon end of things. So, so that connection to the cycling world puts us in contact with people who are a part of the organization of cycling, and one of those contacts is David McQuaid, Pat McQuaid's son, who runs uh, a distribution company in Ireland, and and David's connected to the Irish Olympic. Uh, team. So all during uh, the lead up to Beijing, we were working with David and the Irish Olympic team to develop triathlon racing suits for the Olympics. And uh, that led us to develop a couple of, uh, you know, a racing suit and a two-piece suit for training as well. And, um, you know, we've sort of taken everything that we learned, all the feedback we got from those guys in the lead up to Beijing, and, and we created these suits available for commercial purchase or for, for purchase by the general public as well as suits that we can customize in team colors and logos for the ref, for anyone who wants to buy or put together a team look for themselves in triathlon as well. That's our launch into triathlon. Two-piece suits for men and women and a one-piece racing suit for men and women. And what we tried to do is take some of the things we learned over the last 50 years on the cycling side about comfort and fabric and, and the technical aspects of putting a garment together for competition and translate that into triathlon. So if you want, I can give you a quick rundown on what Harry and Sally are wearing here. Uh, the racing suit, a couple of things that we bring over from cycling. Most of our paddings in our shorts are uh, based with a, a central core of silicone. Silicone is a, is a great um, uh, material to use in cycling chamois because it's, uh, it's, it's sort of a memory fact. It never changes or loses its shape over time. It doesn't degrade like foam does. It, um, it provides uh, cushioning, and it also can be constructed in a way that's breathable and can move heat and moisture away from the body. So it's, it's sort, of, sort of like the perfect core for, uh, for a cycling chamois. Triathletes need a lot less material in that that place. They don't need as much material as a cyclist to wear. So we created a, a custom chamois using a core of silicone that is um, covered in an antimicrobial fabric that uh, tries to shed water as quickly as possible. And, and that's what we took from cycling and put into our triathlon suit. So uh, 
I know that our we're still refining. I think over the uh, the next year we're going to come out with a revision of that chamois and a revision of this suit, and we're still sort of learning our way through how to make that durable and comfortable for athletes at the elite level, and then translate that into something that is wearable by the average athlete as well. So right now our chamois is really geared towards the average athlete, and we're refining refining it for the elite athlete. We also use a um, a water resistance treatment on our fabric from our cycling products called Aqua Zero. Aqua Zero is a is, is a chemical dip that we put fabric through. It's a process that makes the fabric essentially repellent to water. It's not 100% waterproof, but because the water doesn't totally soak through into the fabric like it would, uh, like cotton, for example, or a standard lycra, when you come out of the water, this thing dries out very quickly and it sheds a lot of water very quickly. That's another uh, thing that we learned from our work with uh, our professional cyclists who race in nasty conditions in early spring is to treat fabric with Aqua Zero. Uh, everything else is just, uh, you know, quality and details. Uh, we've got people sewing down on the floor that have been with us for 35 years and putting them into putting the seams together and knowing how to put the zipper in properly and, and really build a quality garment that's going to go out and stand up to repeated use in training, repeated washing, and repeated use in competition without breaking down over one season for you. That's kind of our story about what we're doing with that. Um, Kevin's probably got more experience with wearing this because uh, I'm not quite ready to put myself in something that skin tight. But um, it's an ITU zipper. It's um, you know that this panel construction is meant to kind of pull the uh, the entire garment together against the body to keep it uh, tight and aerodynamic. So if you're running in it or coming out of the water in it, uh, this is a uh, it goes onto the bike uh, smoothly. I don't think there's any challenges with aerodynamics. And comfort. I don't know, Kevin. What would you change? What should well, we do what, better? I, I, I have to just uh, take a step back real quick. Uh, one one thing that I've noticed about Santini garments is um, uh, b before I, I was with Santini, I actually have a, a racing top. I actually have a two piece top. Just the uh, one. There's just the top here. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you can see just the the, the logos that I have on here, like Infinite and um, Beyond Arrow and Bond. But how how are these? I, I was trying to figure out how these were actually put onto the garment because they're not it's not like it's like it's it's not like heated on like a sticker and stuck on like you see with like uh, a lot of other manufacturers it, it's actually like part of the garment yeah sure so um, we make uh, you know back in the old days when cycling jerseys this this jersey looks a little bit this shirt looks a little bit like a cycling jersey of old days right you used to weave them out of wool and you'd have to weave a logo into a panel across the chest so if you look at an old Eddie Merckx poster and it says Multaney across his chest that's a woven design and in the early 80s uh, there was a fabric that came out called um, racing silk which was a white fabric you could print onto and that's when we started putting logos on jerseys so what you're seeing in that jersey is our ability to print on fabric coming from our days of producing you know, our thousand teams and clubs we produce cycling clothing for. The process is pretty simple. This fabric is actually white and we use screen printing to apply the logos and turn this into a fabric that's got multiple colors on it. There's there's two ways to print white fabric or print the um, I'm going to take one step back and I'll give you kind of the whole process. So in order to get a design onto a white piece of fabric, you have to transfer it. So you essentially end up with a large piece of paper you place on top of white fabric and you use a heat steam press and that steam press turns the ink on that paper into steam and that steam soaks into the fabric and that's how you transfer what's on the paper onto the fabric itself. Uh, there's, okay. two, there's, there's two ways to create those, those sheets. Uh, a lot of guys are using digital printers. They look just like big printers and they inkjet printers and they print out sheets and uh, they're good. We use a screen printer to prepare sheets for us because we get a much richer saturation, especially when you're dealing with a transition from like black to white and you want a really crisp edge or when you're dealing with darker colors and you want those colors to appear dark instead of to appear faded and gray like they sometimes come out when they're using when we're using digitally printed transfer sheets. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just see if I can get a close up of like the internet yeah. logo where you can actually see that that black black and white where it's, it's just like you know night and day it's literally sharp. Like, very sharp yeah and I think what we noticed um, prior to the last few years a lot of triathlon racing suits were exactly what you said you take a plastic logo and you heat press it onto a plain suit 
So we do full custom sublimation and we're trying to introduce the, the, the custom clothing concept from cycling into triathlon and make real high-end but fully custom sublimatable triathlon suits. So if you want a hot pink suit with uh, your logo on the front, you can have it. You pretty much anything you can imagine and draw on a computer, you can print on this, onto fabric nowadays. Very, very cool. Go ahead, Andres. I was just going to say, um, you know, Kevin, uh, Kevin likes to see his... Uh, himself um, oiled up in front of the mirror. So I, you're saying the quality of graphics are so good that you could actually put somebody's actual you know, face and everything uh, sure. on a suit if, if they so desired? Sure. We get all, I'm, uh, some of the designs that come across my desk. Uh, I'm amazed by what somebody wants to do, the variety of colors and the amount of detail. But yeah, pretty much anything you can print on paper, you can print onto fabric. <laughs> so Kevin? Great. Okay. Send us a snapshot, and we'll make you a suit of yourself. <laughs> we'll make a, a we'll make a body Andres, suit. I want a picture of Andreas's face right on my my butt. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. No, but we'll um, what what can we um, what can we expect in in the future, uh, Steve? With with Santini, obviously, as you guys get more into the sport of triathlon, you learned a few things. What uh, what sort of uh, ideas or clues can you give us as to what we can expect from the company in, in the future? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons we're in triathlon. One, it's um, it's an exciting sport that involves something that we're very close to, which is cycling. Uh, I think that I think that what you're going to see from us is more variety of clothing that focuses on training. You know, cycling training doesn't require anything, any special clothing. Uh, it's really race day that requires the special clothing when you're a triathlete. We do everything you possibly do to make a cyclist comfortable and warm and protect them from the elements and, and give them um, a durable, long-lasting piece of clothing they can use to train in. So we'll focus on our, our training, our triathlon, quote-unquote triathlon portion of our catalog will always be primarily focused towards the racing side of things, a race day piece of clothing that you can use. Um, other than that, it's it's more about introducing people to Santini and then showing them that we can do all the other things it takes to ride a bicycle and be comfortable doing it. So that that's what I think you'll see from us more. More refinement of the suit, more um, options when it comes to customizing, but uh, I think there's there's not a uh, there's not an infinite variability of what you can do with the racing suit. It's a you know pretty well designed, a pretty well refined concept at this point. And besides some some minor things that we might do on the detail side, and then technology wise, you're going to see a you know a modern racing suit from us, and then you'll see us trying to use the the racing suit as a way to introduce cyclists or triathletes to what we do on the cycling side. I may have to have more sleeveless jerseys in my lineup though if I'm going to try to capture the uh, the triathletes and maybe shorter legs on some of our you know, we don't sell a lot of shorts on the cycling side it's mostly bib shorts and I've got some triathlon friends and I've had to special order shorts for them because I don't really stock them here yet so we'll, you'll probably see some shorter shorts and some you know they want to show the guns so you gotta have some sleeveless but other than that there's nothing really we should be doing special cycling is riding a bike is riding a bike we make well, see, things you know, I, after watching uh, Orca Green Edge uh, win the team time trial the Tour de France this year I, I think I, I, I'm gonna request a, uh, a time trial suit actually for Ironman distance just to yeah. get that little bit of extra aero advantage doesn't take long to put on in, in transition uh, NT1 yeah. and uh, do you have any of those uh, those skin suits around by chance? <laughs> we do, we do. We make one that's available for the public, and then we make uh, sort of a special version of our suit that's uh, available to our athletes, our elite athletes. You know that we've been developing the uh, time trial suit with the Australian Institute of Sport, the national program for Australian athletes for 13, 14 years. And our triathlon suits have been worn to time trial world championships and gold medals at the Olympics. It's, a, it's, it's something we're very, very proud of. The suit that you see those elite athletes wear, if I sold that to the general public, it would last three rides and they would scream at me. It's really a very purpose-built. The fabric is very specifically designed for that day. But we take everything that we learn from working with those elite athletes on those very special race day uh, clothing and we make a, a great uh, skin suit that's available in our, our 365, our year-round catalog and it's available to the general public. So we'd be glad to get you hooked up with a skin suit for Kona and uh, we've got 
you know, on the team side, we make short sleeve and long sleeve skin suits for teams, but we also have something in the catalog that someone who wants a one piece with sleeves and maybe a little bit more cycling specific chamois for the longer distance where transition time, you know, they may have the time to adapt to getting into something like that. We have that available in our catalog. Before we let you go, Steve, uh, where can uh, people get in touch with you or how can they get a hold of, of Santini um, at this time? Santini-US.com. Do you have any other questions for Steve, uh, Kevin? Uh, not this time, but I actually had a request um, recently. Just one, one quick question. I, I have a friend who's uh, part of the Las Vegas Police Department, and they're part of um, this ride that, that every year uh, rides into Washington, D.C. with about 15,000 sure. police officers. Yeah. And they're looking to get some uh, some special uh, police department jerseys going into next year's. What what kind of what's your minimum threshold for for custom uh, for custom jerseys? Do you have a minimum? Sure, we do a minimum of thirty. It takes us about six to eight weeks to produce jersey and, and get it to the U.S. and ship it to a customer. We're generally price competitive, um, but I try to focus on working with clubs and teams that uh, care a little bit more about uh, quality, so they want something that is not just the cheapest thing they could find and uh, are willing to tolerate a little bit longer lead time than some of our competitors who are really focused on small quantity and quick turnaround and compromise on fabric and, and their printing method to get there. Uh, we just did one for, I'll show you one for our local club. I mean, I do this all the time, but, you know, this is a pretty typical jersey for us, but it's, you know, it, it fits a little tighter. It's uh, It's got a, a higher-end fabric in the sleeves and shoulders, a full covered zipper, just all the little things that we can do to make that jersey comfortable and not just cheap. So, yeah, send them my way. And especially, I grew up in Las Vegas, so anything to do with the Metro Police Department, uh, yeah, right. I'm, I'm game to help them out in any way I can, so send them my way for sure. But we have some information on our website about custom clothing. We're open to working with any club or team that wants to, you know, have this factory in Italy that makes clothing for the world champions make their clothing for their club and team as well. Very good. All right, thank you very much, Steve. Hey, Kevin, i got a question for you. Are you doing... Uh, Iron Man Phoenix or uh, Iron Man Arizona in November. It, it's it's between uh, Florida and Iron Man Arizona. It's between those two right now. Okay. Well, if you come to Arizona, we are we're going to set up a booth there, and we're going to be out there talking about Santini, and we'll have suits out for people to to look at more closely. And and uh, since that's in our neck of the woods, we're we're going to be there. Where I mean, I'm ten miles away from the from the lake from Tempe Town Lake. So. Even, if I, even if I don't race uh, Ironman Arizona, I'm still planning on being there regardless. So I will Sweet. see you there. We'd love to have you. All right, Steve. All right, guys. Well, thanks again, Steve. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll catch you later. Okay, bro. Thanks. Take care. All right. So that was, uh, that was great. Um, obviously, like we said, it's, uh, Santini has uh, been a supporter of yours uh, this year. And uh, as I've written the clothes, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of what they've got to offer. But, uh, but certainly, um, you've got some, uh, some race experience in their suit. And I think it's, it's been mostly good thus far. Yeah, I, I actually think it's pretty cool. You can actually get a custom picture. So I could literally put your face on my jersey if I wanted to. I think that's pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that, well, uh, might, that, that might be have, have to be one of our next bets. <laughs> absolutely. So, um, just moving right along, uh, like we said, there's uh, there's a couple of races from this past weekend, but we're going to focus on uh, Boulder 70.3, which you did. Um, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about that race, how it played out uh, overall, but but also your uh, your experience at the race. Absolutely. Well, um, yeah, I have to, to – there, there were a couple reasons why I did Boulder. One, the timing is good. I'm, I'm about six weeks away from Ironman Tahoe, so I want to do a last test. Also, it's at altitude. Um, and I wasn't think, I was thinking going into this race that, well, you know, it's, it's just under 6,000 feet. I should feel it a little bit, but I shouldn't feel it that much. And I could not have been more wrong, Andres. I showed up um, – there's a couple different protocols you can, you can go into uh, – an altitude race with. Uh, you could try to get there as soon before the race as possible, and that's what I did. I ended up getting there about 36 hours before the race. Um, ideally, you, you go there, you know, four weeks in advance and get used to the altitude and acclimate, but, um, you know, the prospect of going to altitude uh, in Boulder for four weeks, um, my wife, you know, being a 30-hour drive away wasn't too practical, so uh, I, I have to just to, to, to fly into Denver uh, Friday night, and uh, I actually stayed at Siri Lindley's house, 
uh, which happens to be about a five-minute walk from race start, so it could not have been more convenient. Um, it was great to see her and some of the series athletes out there, but um, it was a gr it was actually a pretty good field. Um, it was it was more interesting to me actually the women's side. I, I got sadly I got a little bit more of a, a closer look at the women's field uh, just because uh, the altitude affected me pretty bad. Um, but some of the big Kona favorites going in, uh, Amanda Stevens, for instance, uh, she will most likely lead the woman out of the water in Kona. Um, she led out of the water uh, in Boulder, swam j almost just as fast as the pro men by herself, and on her feet she had uh, defending Ironman world champion Leanda Cave right at her feet. So it was pretty impressive to see Leanda sticking on her feet. Um, it, was, it was pretty incredible. They both swam under 25 minutes at altitude. Um, great swims by both of them. Yeah, pretty ridiculous. Amanda Stevens, 24, just under 24.50, and Leanda Cave just three seconds back. So, I, you know, I, I never knew Leanda to be a swimmer like, uh, like Amanda, but certainly, I mean, like you said, right behind her, she was out of the water. Yeah, Leanda is a great open water swimmer, uh, particularly in a wetsuit. They call her Superbird because she's so tall and lean. And I saw her kind of in her in her blue seventy suit, kind of getting ready for the race with Siri zipping her up. Um, and God, she's she just looks like so you know almost like hydrodynamic in, in that in that wetsuit. It's incredible. Um, but uh, Leanda kind of fell off the pace uh, right away on the bike. Uh, Amanda led for the majority of the bike, but got caught. Um, by Melissa Rollison. Uh, Melissa, I guess she got married. Her name is Hushild now. Um, who she she's been a dominant force in the 70.3 circuit. She was a, a former uh, Australian, uh, I think, national team member in the steeplechase. She's a fantastic runner. And Melissa uh, was able to catch Amanda at about mile 30 and pulled away, and then just dominated the run. And uh, she she won this race pretty handily. Uh, Leanda Cave came back. Uh, to catch uh, Amanda Stevens, who had some cramping issues, uh, just a few K from the finish. So Amanda almost got second. Uh, Leanda, you know, did catch her right by the finish, and, and Amanda finished third. So it was nice to see uh, two of my teammates on the podium there and get some money and uh, some confidence going into uh, into Kona. Leanda still has some work to do if she wants to, uh, uh, you know, get back to back at, at Kona. Um, and she's been apparently battling some injuries early in the year. She hadn't been racing too well. hadn't been racing much at all, really. But she doesn't really have to. She's a defending Ironman champion. I think we're going to see her probably at Vegas defend that that, that title. Um, but she's got about eight weeks now uh, before Kona, uh, maybe a little bit more than that, and um, looking forward to her uh, doing well there. Yeah, and one thing I found out about Leanda Cave uh, today, or not today, this week actually, was the fact that she's a big Starbucks fan. And, you know, triathletes and coffee usually go hand in hand. But uh, it, it seems like they're oftentimes they're a little bit more uh, snobby about their coffee or, or picky if, if you want to say that. But uh, she's a big Starbucks fan, which uh, kind of made me laugh a little bit. But hey, whatever, whatever makes it work. She's uh, the defending world champ at uh, both distances, um, so she can do what she wants. Absolutely, and uh, yeah, I, I did notice a lot of the, the Europeans, a lot of the Australians, they tend to be a little bit more of a coffee snobs, and I, I can't blame them. Uh, having trained in Australia, they simply have better coffee over there. We can get a long black or a flat white, and uh, the coffee is all just gourmet, uh, not like the McDonald's and Starbucks stuff you have over here. Um, well, you but, need to come down to San Francisco, man, because there's some good places over here. I, I don't know how it is in Sacramento, but uh, there's definitely some cool spots down here. All right, well... Uh, I'll, I'll see you at uh, Ritual Coffee. The Ritual actually makes some great coffee. They're based out of the Bay. But anyways, uh, with the, with respect to the men's race, um, the, the, the the local boys seem to do, do the best there. Obviously, they're they're acclimated. Uh, Joe Gambles uh, won this race for the third time in a row. Uh, last year, he biked two hours, no minutes, just two hours. And uh, at the pro meeting, they made they made a big to do that. Uh, apparently, he got some drafting help by a motorcycle last year, so they kind of pointed him out that hey. Don't be drafting out the motorcycles. And uh, this this year, um, he he wasn't uh, the leader out of the swim. He had to do some work on the bike. Still biked very quickly, um, but didn't really pull away and dominate until he hit the run. So um, Joe Gambles was able to pull away from uh, Greg Bennett, who is a an amazing runner. So for Joe Gambles to pull away from him and have the fastest, just about the fastest run split of the day, on a, a reasonably it's a, it's a pretty fast, fair course. Uh, but there are some rollers. It's all on, mostly on dirt road. It's a great course. Uh, two laps around the reservoir there, and um, there are a couple other local guys like Paul Ambrose, who's a local there, uh, did well. Uh, actually, uh, Brian Rhodes had a pretty good race. I had a good swim bike. His run 
kind of left a little bit to be desired there. But uh, all the local people from Boulder did really well. Uh, Kevin from Sea Level, uh, not so good. Um, three weeks ago at Vine Man, uh, I had a normalized power of about 319 watts. Um, at, uh, at, at Boulder, my normalized power was 277 watts. So 40 watts different, a little over 40 watts different. Just incredibly blew my mind how much the, I, I actually had a higher heart rate at Boulder. So um, I, I think it just shows that some people can really be affected by the altitude. Well, I, and, and this, this just makes me think of, of uh, not only Ironman Boulder when, when that comes around, but, but definitely Tahoe. It just sounds like Tahoe is just going to be super tough. And people, I, I just don't think people know what they're getting into. People that sign up for, for Ironman Tahoe is a, a beautiful location if you're a skier, whether it's cu cross-country skiing or alpine skier. I, I mean, it's just a, an awesome place to, to go for that kind of stuff. So people probably associate it with just a beautiful venue, and they just don't know how much of a, uh, of, of a tough race that's going to be and how much that's, that, that's going to challenge people on all levels. Yeah, it's kind of like um, kind of like Ironman uh, New York. Anyone that did that race last year, uh, logistically, it was a it was a nightmare. It was a very very tough course. I think a lot of people thought, okay, New York Central Park, it, it's going to be pretty flat, and it was anything but. The first half of that marathon was just about as hilly as any race on the Ironman circuit can possibly be. Combined with high humidity and heat, it made it for a very difficult race. Now Tahoe, um, the starting elevation of Tahoe is in the lake. It's 6,200 feet. Um, that's higher than Boulder. And the bike course goes up well over 7,200 feet at Rockway Summit and also by the Ritz-Carlton by North Star. Um, so it's going to be a very tough course. But also, Andres, is, uh, the weather is going to be much more of an X factor. Anytime you go up over a mile in elevation and you're, you're in the Sierra Nevada mountains, I mean, the Donner Party uh, made, made their, uh, their uh, last winter uh, just a couple miles north of there, the Donner Party. We know how it ended up for them. I know it was a couple months later, but there has been times in the past where on September 22nd, it's been in the 20s in the morning. If that happens, there will not be a swim in Ironman Tahoe. It will be too cold. Uh, there are times when it has snowed on September 22nd. So if, it, if that happens, this could be one of those epic days where uh, you know, Ironman you know, questions if they want to have this race again. But I think it's going to be a beautiful race. I think it's going to be a beautiful course. It's a beautiful area, but it is going to be hard, and people need to be prepared for that. Well, with that being said, I'm sure we'll have plenty of time to talk about Tahoe uh, leading up to the race, especially since you'll be training for it and obviously participating. Um, but, you know, let, let's skip over 70.3 Steelhead. Um, I, I think there, there was enough uh, outside of, of going over the, the results on that race uh, that we should talk about or can talk about. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about Marino first, uh, first time commenting on his plans and, and the KPR? Uh, point system. What, what did you think about, uh, I don't know if you've had a chance to read it, but essentially uh, he doesn't have a problem with the KPR points. Uh, he doesn't have a problem with the KPR points now. He doesn't have a problem with the KPR points as they'll be in 2014. Uh, and obviously he's decided to pull the plug for, uh, for Kona and uh, for the rest of this year. Yeah, well, I think uh, the, the, the top echelon of professional athletes, the, the Craig Alexanders, the Andreas Raylerts, the Marino Van Honockers, uh, Leander Cave, Chrissy Wellington, you know, people like that um, shouldn't have a problem with the, with the qualification criteria as it was and as it's going to be just because if, if you do very well, if you're at the very, very top, um, it's, it's not as difficult. But once you kind of drop out of that top five uh, and having to race more frequently uh, building up until now, um, it, things are changing um, starting next month. Uh, actually, at the end of this month in August, uh, the, the criteria is going to change where there's much more emphasis on top threes, um, top tens at Kona. Um, and uh, you know, as you mentioned uh, earlier today when we were talking, uh, Jay Pursun wrote an op-ed in, in Lava, which is interesting because he's the editor of, of Lava, which I'm not sure why I was considered an op-ed because he is the editor. I'd like to see someone like myself or someone like you or someone that you know, has, a, has a different opinion on anything uh, actually write a, an op-ed. Um, well, yeah, I, I think, you know... I and, and we'd have to have Jay on for this, but I think a lot of people mistake op-ed for opinion, but it's it's supposed to be opposite of, of the editor. Um, and uh, so, unless he was uh, he was uh, ref he was opposing uh, Brad Culp's uh, views, yeah, I, I yeah, I'm a little bit confused about that myself. But um, yeah, so you were saying sorry before I interrupted you. 
Yeah, but but Marino Van Honacker was kind of up against the wall. Um, he he had to race again, uh, most likely to get a, a qualifying slot for Kona. Uh, he has an avulsion fracture somewhere in his pelvis, somewhere in his hip hip area, uh, that's greatly affecting his running. Um, I had a similar issue. Uh, I had a stress fracture on my ilium early in the year. It took me 12 weeks of no running whatsoever, three months off from running, and what that did, uh, it made me start from scratch. I'm still coming back. I'm not racing anywhere near where I was at before. So it's a long road coming back, and I think Marino kind of understood, hey, 2013, it's over, man. I'm, not, I'm one of the best uh, swim bikers in the game, um, but if he wants to come back and be where he was at in Kona in 2012 or 2011, he's got to kind of hit the reset. He's got to come back healthier, figure out what caused that injury, uh, take some vitamin uh, D and calcium supplements, and uh, just focus – just you know, water on the bridge. Focus on coming back strong in 2013. I think we were both in agreement uh, when we talked about this a couple of weeks back that that this is probably what he should do. Um, you know, very very slight possibility that that he was watching this week in triathlon and actually took our advice. But it, it just seems like the right thing to do for Marino. Uh, in in his statement, he did say that he's he's not really. He's not really second guessing his uh, his his approach for this season, and he uh, insinuated that it's working for Eniko Janos. Obviously, Eniko Janos essentially had has had very similar plan to what Marino was hoping to do, and, and race well in, in few races, and and he's done that. Um, so you know, I think he's done the right thing. I think he shouldn't have a problem uh, qualifying for Kona if he's healthy uh, in 2014. Yeah, the one thing going back to uh, to Jay's article um, where he just talked about how how little Marino has raced, and um, I I, th I think it's just uh, it, that 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 comment that he doesn't race much is really just kind of viewed through the lens of of Ironman and triathlon in general, where a lot of people just race almost to a fault. If you look at people that that race, you know, there there are people out there. There's a lot of age groupers I know personally that will race, or at least sign up for ten Ironman races in a year. Um, and then do a countless uh, halves on top of that. Um, now, if, if you look at you know, the, the Ironman of old, if you look at um, you know, people like Dave Scott or um, you know, some of the, the, the heroes of the past, uh, you know, they didn't race very much. They might race Ironman France, and then they raced Hawaii. That was it. And that's all they really cared about, and they, they, they made sure that they were on for, for Hawaii. And it, if you look at other sports, if you look at marathon running, for instance, and, and obviously Ironman concludes with a marathon, if you look at how often Wilson Kipsang or Patrick Macau or the, you know, the, these best marathoners in the world, they might race two marathons a year. That's it. They'll do a couple of halves, a couple of 10Ks, a couple of appearances, but two marathons. That's it. So to say Marino only did two Ironmans and to say that's, that's nothing, uh, I, I, two Ironmans is a lot. Well, I, but, but here's I, – and, and I want to I wanna say where I think Jay was coming from. You had some pretty – uh, some pretty interesting opinions, and, and I want you to, you know, to um, to uh, let me and and let the, the viewers know. But I, I think where Jay was coming from is he was he was arguing against the people faulting Ironman for a Marino's injury, and I think he mentions that in his article, and, and he says that listen, it's not because Ironman forces you to race too much. As a matter of fact. Marino has underraced, and I think that's where his point. I don't think he was criticizing Marino for making a choice of, of not racing. He was just trying to get away from the notion or from from people faulting Iron Man for making him race too much and causing that injury. Yeah, and people have to remember, Iron Man is a brand. It is a company. World Triathlon Corporation is a company, and um, you know it, it's it's one of the few uh, sports I can think of where one company really dominates the sport, like marathon, for instance. Isn't a company, you know. Twenty-six point two miles of running is is not a is not a uh, is not a company, you know. But Ironman is a is a company, and they get to write the rules. So you, know, you can have opinions on it one way or the other. But at the end of the day, they can do whatever the heck they want. Yeah, and um, you know, I, I'm trying to pull up uh, uh, Jay's article just just to see because you know it it. Uh, I think it, it it rubbed people the wrong some people the wrong way. It, it you know I I personally liked it. Um, it, it just I seem to gather that the the, the like you you kind of mentioned this earlier, but the, the people that have an quote unquote easier time qualifying for Kona don't really care too much about the new point system or the fact that you have to race a few times to qualify for Kona. 
it's the people that have to race a lot. And he does mention in his article uh, the the Czech. I think he's uh, he's Czech or he's uh, Croatian. Um, Czech. P- p- yeah, th- you know he's raced like six Ironman. He uh, he mentions um, uh, our 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 friend uh, sponsored by Tri Sports. Oh, geez, I can't come up uh, with his name right now. It's in the tip of my tongue. Um, Tom Gola. Yeah, Th- Thomas Gerlach. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, Tom. And uh, you know, as as people who who race quite a bit, and uh, so I I think ultimately you'll continue to see that people who are not in the top five, top ten, like you said, those are the ones that are going to be most vocal about having to race too much. While while the Sebastian Kinleys and the Marino uh, Van Honakers and the Aniko Yanos, you know, they're going to say whatever. You know, it is what it is. Um, you know, we'll just do what we need to do to qualify for Kona. Yeah, to, to, to be honest, Andres, I, I I don't really care what the qualifi- qualification criteria really is at the end of the day, but what I want to see is I want to see great racing in Kona. I want to see the best Ironman athlete in the world win Kona, and I want to have it be a great race where they leave nothing on the course. I don't want to see a bunch of 100 athletes you know, showing up that are tired, that are ragged, that haven't, haven't peaked truly physically and mentally and spiritually peaked for that day. That, that's what I want to see. I want to see a great race. And um, I, I hope that's what we can see going forward. So, so how do you ensure that? Because, I mean, it seems like they have an okay system now for, for getting the, 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 the best triathletes. It, it seems like they have the, the best system for that or an, a, a good enough system for that, but it also includes a lot of people that just have no, no, uh, no business, for lack of a better uh, word, of, of being there. I mean, so how do, how do you... How do you get better racing and exclude people that just don't have um, a chance at winning? Well, I think that's actually what, what, the, what the new system actually allows for. Um, if you look at people that are, that are you know, I, I would call them um, you know, journeyman triathletes where, where they, they race a lot and accumulate a lot of points. And you have to remember there, there, are, there are limits on how many points you can accumulate with number of races. So you, can, you can take five Ironman races, you can take three half Ironman races, and that's it uh, in terms of the number of races you can, you can actually utilize, the top number of points you can get at those, point, those, those races. And if you look at the, the, the KPR right now, there aren't a lot of athletes that have actually raced five Ironman races. You have people like Matt Russell that has, Peter Vavracek has, Thomas Gerlach has, and maybe those guys uh, don't have a chance of actually winning Kona. Um, but with the new system, the new system is going to put less – you know, favoritism on the people that race a lot and get those points, but it's going to put more weight on doing very well in races. So back in the day, if, if you placed top three, you were in, basically. Um, that's how Yosef Major used to get in. He'd, he'd place, you know, top three at Ironman Arizona, and he'd be in for the next year at Kona. And, um, yeah, you know, then that, that system kind of went away where you had to, you know, chase points. And, and I think that's kind of coming back. I think it's kind of a, a mix now what's going to be going forward where, it's it's kind of where if you do very well in races you're rewarded, and um, if you don't do very many races, if you do, don't do very well, you probably don't have a chance. So I you know if I'm reading Jay's article right, just to kind of expand upon your point, uh, it says guys like Andy Potts who barely qualified for Kona under the new point system would have shot up the rankings, um, as as well as as Matt Russell. Uh, I think he was taking into consideration his win at Ironman Canada as well as. Um, Kristen Moeller, who under the current system would have been 24th, under the new system would have been 11th, and Jesse Donovan going from 41st to 16th. So I guess it does make a big difference. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, that the, I think with, the, with the new system, so starting in 2014, I think we're going to see uh, a field that uh, I think we're going to see a higher level of racing uh, compared to what we've seen in the last two years. I hope that's the case. Well, um, I'm sure this is not the last we've we've heard of it. Um, uh, obviously, the first uh, the first cut, if you will, uh, for KPR has been set. Um, you know, we've we've got some guys that uh, that are going to be making a push over the coming weeks at Ironman Montreblanc, Ironman Canada, and uh, we'll see how that plays out for the remainder of of the slots. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think this is probably uh, as we get closer to Kona, not not the last you'll hear from from this. And uh, I'm, you know, we'll see how it plays out. Um, but I think the core uh, the core of that race, I mean, you can start kind of getting an idea of, of who's going to show up and who may be making a play for the titles. Absolutely. 
I don't know uh, if you have any sort of um, tech for the for the week. Um, I know that uh, as as we were speaking with uh, Steve, um, something showed up at my door, uh, which yeah. I'm pretty excited about. Uh, I I really um, I have a feeling uh, about what it is. I don't know for sure. Um, What's that, what size are they? That's all I want to know. <laughs> Uh, size 46 and a half, uh, which is, is uh, a, a good size, uh, for me at least. Uh, what, so, do think, what do you think they are? Uh, you know, I have a feeling that those are the, uh, the new Vapor Pluses. Um, so if that's the case, I'll be, uh, I'll be riding, after I do a little bit of a, a track workout today, I'll be going out for a quick spin uh, to try them out and certainly on um, Thursday, um, I'll probably get a, a little bit of a, a ride in as well. And um, this weekend, I'm I'm doing a, a road race, and definitely not going to be wearing those in a road race. There's always a possibility of crashing, and the last thing I want to do is scuff up my new uh, my brand new uh, my brand new kicks. So uh, maybe we can um, look at those uh, a little bit next week once I've had a little bit of a chance to uh, to ride them. But speaking of tech, um, you know, I, there, there's always, uh, I, I've been uh, kind of bombarding with some text messages of uh, little strategies I have here and there to kind of pick up speed. Uh, Which I, I, I love, by the way. I, I, I love that kind of stuff, and, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's not a bad idea to bring it up. But, yeah, why don't you tell people just sort of the things that you've been running, uh, running through? Yeah, well, I had this motto uh, a couple of years ago where, you know, seconds add up to minutes, minutes add up to hours. And um, you know, little little things you can do. I, I mean, obviously, Team Sky and Cycling has gone after those those marginal gains, those little gains that you know, if you take one of them by themselves, not a big deal. But if you have 20 of them, it can add up to be quite a big deal. So things like uh, you know, looking into a, a key key race. Um, you know, there's a couple things I'm doing for, for Ironman Tahoe, for instance. Uh, you know, I, I want my goal is to get 20 extra watts. So how do you get 20 extra watts? You know, that's a huge amount of power. Um, so there's things like you can deal with um, you know friction facts. If you know frictionfacts.com, they make a special change, uh, and they also have reports on different bearings and things like that. Um, so just by changing out just a chain alone can get you uh, five watts off just a, st a stock chain. So uh, that's one of the things. Another thing is looking at maybe some skin suit options for Tahoe. And then uh, when you mentioned those Bont shoes, um, Bont is actually coming out with a new model shoe. I just saw on Google Plus. They're coming out with a, a new version of the Chrono shoe, which is actually like an aerodynamic shoe, um, almost like a, a shoe cover on steroids, um, which is a which has actually been banned by the UCI, uh, which I have to think has to you know you know add a, 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 you know take away a couple watts from your drag. Um, I would love to get get a pair of those, but also they have the Zero Pluses, which you know can't hurt as well. Yeah, and you're you're 100 percent right. Uh, Team Sky has been the most popular about uh, publicizing that that marginal gains. Uh, obviously, we heard a lot about it with uh, Team Great Britain at, at the Olympics, and uh, you know, especially on the on the velodrome, a lot of people were just wondering where they were getting um, their their uh, extra kick from, if if you will, and and. I mean that that was pretty much their answer. A few watts here, a few watts there, and you know it adds up to a lot. And over the course of an Ironman, when you're out there for four and a half hours uh, on the bike, I mean 20 watts—that's a huge amount. I mean that that goes from, you know, if you can go at the same speed, pushing 300 watts versus uh, 320 watts, I mean that makes a big difference. And I'll, I'll actually give you a little bit of scoop here because uh, it actually uh, kind of ties back to a comment I want to make. The, the comment I want to make is the, the one area you never want to skip in in Ironman is your nutrition. So if you're looking at you know two bottles on your frame and you're thinking, well, maybe I can take one off, maybe save a little bit of drag or weight, leave the bottle on because those those extra you know, three to 600 calories you have in that bottle is going to help you uh, later in the race. Uh, trust me. And um, actually, uh, one of the little anecdotes I picked up uh, in, in Boulder was uh, Leanda Cave recently went down to Aerosports, which is a kind of a, a velodrome-based, uh, almost like it's almost like a wind tunnel where they, where they measure strain gauges and speeds. But it's actually on a velodrome, so it's a, almost like a live environment where you're actually pedaling. And a lot of people hate on Leanda's setup because she she attaches so many bottles and uh, little flasks all over the place. And one of the things they found down at, at, at Aerosports was her, her Torhance uh, 30 bottle on the front 
her, her bottles on the down tube, her bottles behind her, her flask on the top tube. Her bike was actually more aerodynamic with all that stuff strapped onto it than it not being strapped on at all. So it's very interesting to see how, how uh, idiosyncratic uh, aero advantages are based on who you are. Yeah, and uh, you know this is going to start driving me nuts because it, it, it depending on who you speak to, depending on who you talk to, depending on the study, depending on whether it's the velodrome, depending on whether it's the AT wind tunnel or the Arizona faster wind tunnel. I mean, you seem to get just all kinds of different things. So, you know, people at the end of the day, you got to do what's going to make you go faster in your mind. I mean, it, it's just got to be as simple as that. And if if getting a, a, a one of those chains and a cast bambino and a skin suit, if that's really going to do it for you, I'm sure it will do it for you. Amen, brother. So, I, you know, just like we're not done talking about the KPR, it's not triathlon talk unless you start getting into, you know, the little little numbers here and there and the little arrow, you know, drag talk. So I'm sure we'll have plenty of that. But, Kevin, I don't have anything else. Uh, I don't have a tip. Um, usually you're the guy with the, the wonderful tips. Um, and, uh, yeah, unless you have anything else to add, I'm out of words. Me too, man. Let's go train. i gotta, I got to get some training done. So uh, if you're watching at home, get off your lazy butt and go, go train. Well, yeah, we'll be back uh, next week, as always. And, uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. And, yeah, we'll see you next week. All right, thanks, Andre. See you guys later.